<laughs> Does anyone remember what this was called? How about the whole thing? <laughs> neuromuscular junction. And that's what we were talking about was the neuromuscular junction, the point of contact between the nervous system and another tissue. In this case, we're going to call this the neuromuscular junction because it interfaces or synapses with muscle cell. Um, anyone remember what the neurotransmitter was? Acetylcholine. So acetylcholine, the last thing you should have had in your notes was the molecule travels across that distance of the synaptic gap. Okay. Now, one of the things that we need to understand here is this is passing information or it's passing a signal from one point to another point. And signals like that are degraded. They don't last in infinitesimally. They don't last infinitesimally. Is that a word? That's not a word. They don't, they don't have any sort of um, ability to maintain their normal <coughs> amplitude. The amplitude slope slowly, slowly degrades. Now, if we let it just degrade, we would lose the signal even before it really did anything. So we actually do a variety of things physiologically and anatomically to protect the integrity of the signal. And one of those is centered around a cell type called a Schwann's cell. And Schwann cells uh, are going to wrap themselves around the whole neuromuscular junction and encase that junction. So they wrap around and encase the neuromuscular junction. And by doing this, having the Schwann cell so that it's wrapped around and protecting the neuromuscular junction, it isolates it, isolates the junction from the extracellular fluid. So we isolate the junction from the extracellular fluid. And so all of the acetylcholine that's released, it's going to stay near the neuromuscular junction. It's going to stay near the muscle cell rather than seeping out into the extracellular fluid. So we don't degrade that signal. We protect it from being degraded. So the muscle fiber in that patch of muscle right up by the neuron contains typically around 50 million acetylcholine receptors. Okay, So these acetylcholine receptors, again, they're bound in the membrane. Acetylcholine receptors are bound in the membrane. And in order to get all of those acetylcholine receptors in a very small patch of space, the membrane is going to be folded up. So we have junctional folds that are going to exist in the synapse. to increase the surface area for the receptors. So by folding up the membrane, so the membrane is going to look more like this on that portion of the cell. And by doing that, in the same distance, so let's say this is our distance from here to here, you know, we might be able to get in this distance millions and millions of receptors. But by having these folds in here, this lengthens that area out and extends the, the, the surface area significantly so we can pack in those 50 million acetylcholine receptors. Now, what was one thing that was unique about muscle cells in reference to the nucleus? They're multinucleated. The nucleus that's nearest or nearby the neuromuscular junction is actually going to be primarily responsible to generate acetylcholine 
receptors. So that nearby nucleus continually pumps out new acetylcholine receptors to replace the old receptors. So not only do we have a lot of them packed into the membrane, 50 million of them, but they're constantly being turned over. So we replace the old receptors. Now, even though this is drawn and it looks like that this is pretty independent, this is incorporated into tissue. And what that means is that there's other cells and other material that are in the extracellular fluid that are really, really nearby. So we would have our Schwann cells that sit over and kind of wrap around that whole neuromuscular junction. But we also go a little bit step further here and we isolate the whole unit from the connective tissue as well. And we cover it with a material called basal lamina. So we have this covering called the basal lamina. Again, this isolates the neuromuscular junction from connective tissue. But it also is going to contain, along with the sarcolemma, an enzyme. So there's going to be an enzyme that's present that has the sole responsibility to break down acetylcholine. So just to make sure everybody understands what I'm saying here, we have the basal lamina that contains the enzyme to break down acetylcholine, but also the membrane itself, the sarcolemma of the muscle cell, contains the same enzyme. Okay? So we can subject the enzyme, and in fact, this, I'm sorry, subject the acetylcholine, and in fact, the acetylcholine is constantly degraded by this particular enzyme. This enzyme, by the way, is called acetylcholine esterase. Okay, so acetylcholine esterase, A-C-H-E, is an acceptable abbreviation. Acetylcholine esterase activity remains elevated all of the time. And what's happening is there's some acetylcholine at a very small basal rate that seeps out of the, out of the neuron, and that acetylcholine degrades and breaks up that acetylcholine. The acetylcholine esterase degrades and breaks up the acetylcholine before it really binds in any significant manner to the acetylcholine receptor. And this is how we maintain the muscle in an off position, so to speak, to prevent it from going through the rest of the process towards contraction. So we have to overrun acetylcholine esterase in order for the muscle to contract. So when calcium enters into the cell to cause the muscle to contract, we have to have millions and millions and millions and millions of molecules of acetylcholine released all at one time. And then we overwhelm acetylcholine esterase. It can't keep up with all of the acetylcholine that's being released. So some of it's being degraded at a very low rate, but most of it is at a very high rate interacting with the receptor. So then we can turn off acetylcholine re release. Let's say we want to now relax the muscle or stop contracting the muscle. We turn off acetylcholine release. No more acetylcholine is dumping in at a high rate into the synapse, the synaptic cleft, and that acetylcholine esterase in the basal lamina and the sarcolemma are going to break down the acetylcholine esterase to aid in turning off contraction. Okay. 
to the AIDS and turn it off contraction. <clears throat> and we have to do that. We have to basically turn off the nerve signal and stop the release of acetylcholine to allow the muscle to relax. Yes, Paige. So when the muscle is resting or increasing the acetylcholine? No, when we're when the muscle is at rest, acetylcholine esterase activity outpaces the basal level of acetylcholine release. Okay. And then when the muscle needs to contract, we overwhelm acetylcholine esterase by over-release or by massive release of acetylcholine. Which is causing the muscle. Which then is going to cause the muscle to contract. And we're actually going to talk about that right now. We're going to talk about how do we excite a cell. So let's talk about exciting a cell. And really, a lot of the principles we're about to talk about uh, can be applied to a variety of different cell types, not just necessarily muscle. But we're going to take it specifically for skeletal muscle. Is, that, is the B supposed to be C? Or? Yeah, two muscle contraction. A was muscle innervation. B. It's like a probably about three or four pages back. Basically, I was trying to set the stage from the anatomical perspective, and now we're going to begin to talk about the physiology. What's going on physiologically? So to excite the cell. We have to know a little bit about the membranes of the muscle and of the nerve cells. And those membranes are going to contain extremely high numbers of ion channels. So a large number of ion channels. And these ion channels We've already been able to identify a few of them. One is the voltage-gated calcium channel that helps to facilitate the release of acetylcholine. The other is actually the acetylcholine receptor itself. It's a ligand gated channel. So we're going to find that these ion channels act to create current by allowing ions to move across the membrane or across the barrier. So the first thing that I really want to do here is I want to take a look at a resting cell or resting cells. So in all of our cells, the inside of the cell is always going to be more negative when the cell is at rest. And the reason that is, is because we have a high amount of anions, or stable anions. So inside of the cell, we have DNA. DNA is negatively charged. We have ATP. ATP is negatively charged. We have other proteins that are negatively charged. And these are immovable in the sense that they don't readily cross the cell membrane. DNA is not being transported in and out of the cell. It's stuck inside of the cell. And so the negative charge that it holds, the inside of the cell is going to have this huge negative. So if I were just to kind of sketch out a model of the cell membrane, I could put up two lines to represent the cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, the lipid bilayer. And I could call one side ECF representing the extracellular fluid and the other side the ICF representing the intracellular fluid and then just draw in a big minus sign to represent that there's this large quantity of negative ions that are immovable and so they influence the inside of the cell to be 
overall negative. And that's what you see here with these big proteins. So whenever we re reference the charge of the cell, we always reference from the inside. So in the case of a resting cell, we would say that the resting cell is negative. Or if we were going to give it a, an actual volt reading, say we used a voltmeter to measure the inside of the cell, we would say it was minus 90 millivolts or minus 70 millivolts. And the minus sign just indicates that we're more negative inside of the cell. So we're more negative inside, which means that we are more positive outside. And across this membrane, we can say that because we're more negative inside, more positive outside, so I could put a kind of a big positive here to represent that we're more positive outside, the membrane is said to be polarized. In that term polarized, most of you probably are pretty familiar with polarized, um, and maybe just not by name really, but right now I would say politically the United States is very polarized. And what that means is that we have Democrats who are extremely liberal, and there's not too much in the middle, and then we have Republicans that are extremely conservative, and there's not much in the middle. And so we have two different viewpoints without much in the middle. The globe is also polarized, right? We have a North Pole, and on the opposite side, we have the South Pole. A magnet is polarized. We have a South Pole on a magnet and a North Pole on a magnet, and they're opposite from each other. A battery is polarized because it has a positive side and it has a negative side. The cell membrane can be polarized at rest because there's more positive outside, more negative inside. Okay, so membrane is going to be polarized like a battery. Now, in addition to this overall negative influence inside of the cell from our immovable anions, we also have other ions that are more mobile that are in an unequal distribution around that cell membrane. So just to give you a brief kind of little view here of the ion distribution of a typical muscle cell, in the extracellular fluid, we typically have a large amount of sodium ions. So if I were to go back up here and draw a representation of what I just said here, that we have a large amount of sodium outside of the cell, I'm going to draw a very large Na to represent there's a lot of sodium out here. And then on the inside, I'm going to re represent that with a very small Na, representing a very low amount of sodium. Now the opposite we're going to find out is actually going to be true for another ion like potassium. There's going to be more potassium inside the cell than outside of the cell. So intracellular fluid, we're going to have a high ion concentration. Now, this is a positive chart, right? So there is actually, even though the inside of the cell is overall negatively charged, there's actually still positively charged ions inside of the intracellular fluid. The stationary anions stay in the cell because there is no mechanism to allow them to cross the membrane. So stationary anions stay in the cell because there's no mechanism to cross the membrane. And I've already sort of hinted at what we got inside um, the cell for our anions, but just so that you have them written down. Proteins, a lot of them carry a negative charge. The big one are the nucleic acids, both, both RNA and DNA. 
and then phosphate containing materials such as ATP. So all of these are going to have a negative influence. So there's a negative influence, but there's also still some positive ions represented in the form of potassium inside of the cell. What is it Proteins. Now, by having these unequal distributions, we create what's known as a potential or electrical potential. Okay, electrical potential. Another name for electrical potential that you're probably going to be more familiar with is just simply voltage. What an electrical potential is, is it's a reference to the distribution of ions across a barrier. And it's potential, it's a potential because it has the potential to perform or do work. Okay, so it's electrical because it's charged particles. It's a potential because it has the potential to do, to do work. So a battery You've all seen a double A battery before and you'll know that this side is typically deemed as positive and this side is deemed as negative. Now it's not typically sodium and potassium and things like that. It's usually uh, a, a molecules that give up electrons really, really easily. But what happens here is there's a barrier inside of the battery. It's a membrane. And on this side there's a material that is highly electronegative, meaning that it, I'm sorry, is a, a low electronegativity, which means it gives up its electron really easily. On this side, there's typically uh, something that's more highly electronegative, which means it accepts electrons. So nickel and cadmium are two examples of nickel-cadmium battery. Nickel gives up the electron really easily. Cadmium picks up the electron really easily. So if this barrier were, be, were be to be made permeable to electrons, the electrons from here would cross over into this compartment here. This membrane is impermeable, though. But if we route a wire around there and maybe we have some sort of object, let's say a light bulb. So we have a light bulb and it comes back over here. We can turn that light bulb on. By turning that light bulb on, that's called work. And the way that we're doing it is we've established a concentration gradient or electron gradient where the electron can travel through the filament of the light bulb to cause that light bulb to come on as those electrons go to the higher electronegative side of the battery. Okay, does that make sense? So in terms of the cell membrane, Rather than routing around the membrane, the membrane is just simply going to be selectively permeable. We can turn the membrane on and off to allow um, those ions to cross. Now, let's see if you know a little bit about electronics. Do you happen to know what this is as the electrons flow through the circuit? Do you know what that's called in terms of electronics? It's the flow of electrons from one point to another point. I'll give you a hint. River, it's current. Yeah, rivers have, have current as well because water flows from one point to another point. Current gives us the ability to do work. If I put this into an, uh, if I plug that into a uh, flashlight, I can turn the flashlight on. That light being emitted is doing work. Or you can put it in your cell phone and you can do all the different operations in your cell phone. Current is what actually generates the capability or, or is what's used to, to do work. Now, anyone happen to know what the voltage is for a AA battery? It's 1.5 volts. Oh, no. Okay, it's going to come back. Oh, it's going to be like that. Oh. 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 
Yeah. It'll come back, don't worry. Start notebook, not the sign. It'll come back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can do away with smart board and just go back to the back. I hope it works. Okay, fine. I love chalk boards. Yes, I love chalk. Chalk is so much fun. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> She's out of faith. Okay, so it's 1.5 volts. And that measurement is basically indicating that when the battery is fully charged, there is a difference of 1.5 charges in terms of volts between the two different compartments. In fact, there's more electrons on this side making this side more negative, less electrons on this side making it more positive. So, on, on either side of the membrane. Mm -hmm. The membranes in cells can also be measured to evaluate their voltage, which represents the electrical potential. You need voltage. What if you had zero volts? How much current could you generate? No current, which means no work. So in order to have the potential to do work, you need voltage. In order to have current, you need voltage. Okay. So the muscle at rest the muscle cell at rest is going to have a voltage. It's at rest because it's not making the membrane so permanent. It's not selected any particular ion across. So we're not generating any current, which means we're not doing any work. So it's just at rest. That muscle cell at rest the voltage that can be detected. And literally, just like you can go to your car battery with what's called a multimeter or a voltmeter and put the, the red on, on the red terminal and the black on the black terminal, and you'd get a reading probably right around 12 to 14 volts for a car battery, you can use a multimeter to measure cell voltage as well. Now, it's not just something you go over to the auto parts store to pick up. It's, a lot more high tech, but the principles are basically the same. You have an electrode that sticks into the cell, and you have an electrode that stays out of the cell across that barrier. And when we do that, we can measure the voltage, and our voltage in a muscle cell is minus 90 millivolts. Now, why is it minus 90 millivolts? In particular, why is it minus? Because we're referencing the intracellular fluid. So the influence of those anions makes the inside of the cell more negative by 90 millivolts compared to the outside of the cell. So this <clears throat> minus 90 millivolt electrical potential or minus 90 millivolt voltage is called a resting membrane potential. And that is going to be the voltage for a cell to generate a current to do work. Minus 90 millivolts for a muscle cell. We're actually going to find out that there are different resting membrane potentials for different cell types. The resting membrane potential for a nerve is right around minus 70 millivolts. So about minus 90 millivolts resting membrane potential. Now, 
what would happen if I took a battery and I just set it down here on the tape? Measure the voltage today, 1.5 volts. That's double weighted battery. Let's say we go away and we come back in here and I come and I measure that voltage again. What's going to happen? Is it going to still be 1.5 volts? It's actually going to be less. We're going to decrease the voltage. And why is that? What's that? Um, okay. It's not a perfect system. There's no such thing as a perfect system. And so even though there's a barrier in there that's impermeable, it's not completely 100% impermeable. So some of those electrons escape. And that changes the difference in the charge between the two cells on either side of that valve. If the battery can't do it, then do you think in this world of slowly degrading uh, enthalpy and all of that great stuff, can we maintain it without doing anything without putting any sort of effort in? We can't. The membrane is slowly going to head towards zero millivolts. And at zero millivolts, we have no current, no ability to do work. So we have to maintain that resting membrane potential. And the way that we maintain the resting membrane potential is through what's known as a sodium potassium pump. Sodium potassium pumps. Now, I actually talk about sodium potassium pumps in a little more detail later on, but just to give you a little bit of a reference here. Here is our normal resting membrane potential concentration gradients. Sodium is higher outside than it is inside. Potassium is higher inside than it is outside. How would potassium want to move? Yeah, out of the cell. I, I didn't hear you. <laughs> so potassium has a tendency to leak out. Sodium has a tendency to leak in. And the leak is actually different. Um, the rate of the leak is different. And so we're going to have changes in our minus 90 millivolts. And as we change it, we change the ability to do work. So when the membrane is at rest, we want to maintain it right around minus 90 millivolts. And so enter the sodium-potassium pump. Sodium-potassium pump is going to take two pass potassiums and are going to move those inside. It's going to take three sodiums and it's going to move it outside. Okay, so three potassium or two potassium in, three potassium out. It's disproportionate because there's the disproportionate in the amount of leak coming in and going out, right? So as the sodium-potassium pump works, moving sodium out, potassium in, we can maintain the resting membrane potential. Now it's a pump. Pumps are used to go against some sort of force. A water pump is going to move water from a low lo lo location to a higher location or it's going to move it around some sort of circuit or something like that. That's going to require energy. So whenever you see the term pump, know that it's going to require energy. And where am I going to get my energy from? Pump. Where do we get energy from? ATP. So every time the pump cycles, one duty cycle of that pump requires one ATP molecule. Now, think about it. How many muscle cells do you think there are? In, gen in general terms, are there a lot or are there a little? There are a lot. And each of those muscle cells has got a lot of sodium potassium pumps, which means we have a lot of membrane that we need to maintain a resting membrane potential, which means we need to expend a tremendous amount of ATP in order to manage the system. 50% of your calories, which most Americans consume about 2,000 calories a day, about a thousand of those calories that you consume produce ATP to feed into the 
function of the sodium potassium pump. About 50% of your caloric intake goes to operating and maintaining resting membrane potential in all of our different cell types. All right, why don't we take a little bit of a break, and when we come back, we'll talk about breaking this resting membrane potential, manipulating the resting membrane potential to generate a new, uh, or to generate a signal.